Good morning. Yeah. Before I forget, I better thank my lovely wife. That's right. Vonda put together this PowerPoint. Born in 1965, grew up in a family of six. So I got two, I got three older sisters, one older brother, one younger brother. So it was a, a lot going on. And high school, I was uh, president of the art club and as a senior, of course, I was uh, constantly drawing, so I, I enjoyed that. And, and military, I did, if you remember Grenada, I went down to Grenada. I, I was drawing there too, got some drawings. And I was invited to join my unit's Facebook group and we do um, reunions at Fort Bragg once every two years. So it's an airborne unit, so I jumped out of a perfectly good airplane. <laughs> it was fun. I enjoy that. <clears throat> but I did the military, did the Army, the National Guard, and then got out. And I worked in a factory up until 2007. And uh, NAFTA stopped that, so I had to get another job. So fortunately, I got a job in a leather store, which was in the same small town of Ramsor, North Carolina. And the owner of the um, leather store, he said that he hired me because I would not stop talking about pottery. And I was no threat to taking any of his customers away. <laughs> because he had experience training people and then they buy a sewing machine, they learn how to work in leather, so they take some of his customers away. And he said, I just would not stop talking about pottery all day long. And he was a collector. He had some M.L. Owens pieces from um, Sigrev area. And he, he does publish the Ramsor Bulletin today. And he gave me some copies that he put some of my pieces in there as, as historical. And then uh, Albright pottery is in Ramsor. So it goes on and on and on. Most of y'all have, have examined some of the potters from the Ramsar area, possibly Sigrev as well, of course. But uh, And then pottery, I started, a, a great estimate would be the fall of 1994. Sid Luck was a chemistry teacher in my high school, and um, he said I was in one of his study halls, so I wasn't that that bad of an influence on him. But uh, he, he trained me in pottery, and we've been friends since 1994, so we, we do shows together. The, uh, if you're familiar with the Hickory Show, which is in Hickory the third weekend of March, I'm pretty sure. The North Carolina Pottery Center, I remember that being created. And um, what else was it? The, the Hickory Show, I remember being invited to Barry and Alan Huffman's home. Uh, they were discussing the very first inception to to bring about the hickory show so they put me in the basement just to be out of the way and i was surrounded with metters pottery edwin metters lanier metters all these giant berlin craigs bicentennial pizzas celebration 1976 this is this is probably a collection of uh, carol Gorelick. i met carol through another collector and she had a house in blowing rock and a house in charlotte and uh like Gabe said earlier, it was like walking through my own head when I went to her house in Blowing Rock. It was pottery everywhere, and, and I had no idea. But we, I, I don't know how many years I was, I was selling pottery to her, and um, she she introduced me to other people, and it just kind of branched out. It was it was before eBay was invented, and uh, one one time I got a phone call from a lady that said my brother-in-law came over to my house and saw a piece of pottery that. Um, that I had bought off the internet. And she said that he's hard to, to buy for, so would you make him a piece of pottery? And I said, sure. And she said, you know who it is, it's James Earl Jones. So, so I, I made a statue of a humanoid figure and it was, I didn't have the internet, so I went to Blockbuster Video <laughs> and I got every movie that he was in that I could think of and, and saw illustrations like the, the Hunt for Red October the Lion King, I painted on all over the body of the, the humanoid. And uh, they were so sweet, he sent me a signed autograph, thank you for this, and uh, I got it at home doing that. This is probably one of my first shows. And um, I think that was at Monksville. No, it was at Monksville. No, it was at uh, Brattonsville. There is a, there's like a revolutionary town, little community in Monksville, McConnell, South Carolina. 
that they allow potters to set up and they rotate, you know, now they're doing reenactments. There's some of them. That to the top left is the first jug I ever turned in my life. When, when I, so they categorized me a folk potter because I don't have any formal education in pottery. I did not know which way the pottery wheel was supposed to turn. <laughs> Sid Luck said, you need to buy a pottery wheel and do this. And I was down there annoying him forever. So I bought a pottery wheel and it was a, it was a left, it was a clockwise or counterclockwise reversible motor. So I just guessed, I guessed clockwise. So I was turning and turning and turning to learn how to center and I was working really hard. You know, I was, I was really wanting to learn how to turn. And finally I went down there to Sid's and to, to join him and, and I was like, this wheel is wrong. <laughs> and he was like, what do you mean it's wrong? And I was turning clockwise. He said, you're turning backwards. And it was too late. I, could, I, was, I had gone too far you know, and I was not turning back. Later I talked to Daniel Johnston and he said that they do that in other countries. And I learned the word Coriolis effect. It means the way the, 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 the toilet bowl spins its opposite on the opposite side of the world. And I told that to some scientist one time, and he said that means absolutely nothing to, to your turning. So, <laughs> I'm sorry I even mentioned that. But I, I was just throwing out those big words, the Coriolis effect. It sounds good. This is Edwin Metters. I was very, very fortunate to meet him. He's, he passed away, but I, me and Vonda went to his house one time, and well, back it up, uh, there was a show called Folk Fest, and, and they, they had this collector there that had set up Edwin Metter's pieces that he had sold, and I found out that this guy was Edwin Metter's mailman. And I thought that was a little questionable ethically. He would stop and get out of his mail truck and go ask Edwin every day, do you have a, a rooster for sale? And sometimes Edwin would say, yes, I do. And he was buying roosters for years and reselling them. And he, was, he was so fortunate to be able to do that. But it was like almost impossible to get one of this guy's roosters. So me and Vonda went down there one time in a RAV4. And it had been raining so much, there was a giant mud hole in his yard in his driveway. But I went through it in the RAV4. I thought, while well, I'm here, I might as well do it. And, and I beat, beat on his door, and he's in his early 90s. He was asleep. And he got up, and I asked him if he had a rooster, and he said yes. And he came out swinging it upside down <laughs> like that. <laughs> and it was blue and green. And so I paid him $300 for that rooster. It was beautiful. I still have it. So that's, that's one of those pottery stories you tell. This is, this is probably windy. Uh, Carol's daughters, some of her collections. This one, some, some of the pieces I do are one of a kind because I, I don't really, for some reason I, I just kind of branch out. It's like if I do one or two of an item, I might not do it again for several years. Like this particular piece right here, if I'm not mistaken, that is Blackbeard the Pirate from North Carolina, Edward Teach, y'all from North Carolina, you know who that is. But that's a one of a kind. And then I made one of one of these Wonder, Wonder Woman or Wendy, but I took one of these Wonder Woman statues to a comic book store one time, and I had it in the box. And I asked the guy, "You want to see one of my statues?" And he said, "Sure, bring it out here." And I brought it out, and I could tell he was doing poker face. <laughs> he wanted to bust out laughing so bad that this is so stupid looking. <laughs> That is nothing, but he said, he was like, no, I really, I, I like that, but I just can't sell that. <laughs> this is something that's folk art, it's not for comic book shows. I mean, I could do that, but it might not be so successful in that market. But anyway, moving right along. So show, yeah, the shows, I've, I've been doing the Brantonsville show for quite a long time, and uh, the, the Hickory, the Catawba Valley, Pottery and Antiques Festival. This place, the Mint Museum in Charlotte, they invited me one time to set up some pieces and it wasn't really me setting it up, it was some, some, of, some of Carol's friends. But that was fun. There's the Hickory Show. There's me with this particular, my swirl piece. There's other potters that do swirl wear and they are just crystal clear and perfect on it. Well, I'm not. Mine turned out to be a smear. 
It's, and this one here is a picture of cupids firing arrows at a flaming heart. And on the bottom of the jug it said, I'm pouring my heart out over you. I forgot about that. That's the Last Supper. Yeah, that's, that's the Last Supper. I do maybe one of those a year. I, I enjoy doing the Last Supper, but it's a technical piece. The first one I ever did, Sid Luck, I showed it to him. He turned me a platter because I couldn't turn that well. And I painted it on there, and he thrust it back in my hand, and he said, I can't sell that. So, the wounds of a friend are faithful. So I did not sell, I sold it to a friend of mine, but then I went back and started doing more technical, slow down, it takes about two days to do a decent job on the Last Supper. So if I don't do it right, then I don't do it at all. So, okay, I just want to say that. This is the piece that I, that James, that similar to James Earl Jones. This piece started out as, um, it's a science fiction writer, I cannot remember his name right now, but it's the tattooed. tattooed man, yeah. I started out doing that as the idea. And then it morphed into um, a customized piece for James Earl Jones with all the pictures of, uh, of, of movies that I could find that he did. And right on the butt of the piece, I painted Darth Vader's face. <laughs> and I think that was the funniest part of the whole thing. But later, the ones that I did like last year, I haven't done one of these in like a year. The, the, the um, composition now, all the paintings have meaning, like um, tennis, there's a tennis racket on his elbow and a tennis ball and that's tennis elbow, there's a rose on his cheek, there's a question mark on his nose and that's the nose, nose, and it's covered, it's covered with every one of them. Um, inside of the hand is a bird and, and the other, there's a, there's a bush with two birds, so the, met, the, the saying is a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, so all of them have meaning. So that's an interesting piece. There's a, a hot dog on the foot. It's a foot long hot dog. <laughs> and there's a, a nail painted on the toe. It's a real tiny illustration, and it's a toe nail. So the, the, it goes on. And there's bees around his ears. It's bee ear wax. I, like I said before, I turned uh, turned backward, and my swirl was in reverse. My other my, one of my other friends in Statesville, Walter Fleming. I think he's 83, and he's had a hip replacement. He said, I still turn pottery. He's all happy guy, but uh, he turns to to he turns left-handed the same way I do. So he's one of the few that I've met that turn the same backwards. That I, we've done collaboration pieces before. He turn and I put a face on and then and so forth. And then we just have fun talking about pottery together. But if you ever get a chance to go to Statesville, he's a good place to visit. He's got a big warehouse. He's he's a really fun guy. I use. Um, I use uh, bis uh, high water clay in Asheville. That's predominantly where I get my clay from if I don't go through Sid Luck. And Desert Buff is for face jugs and um, coffee cups. And Craggy Crunch is another high water clay for the hand built items. So I do some slab for hand building. And then I paint with Amico velvet underglazes. And I remember when I first started they really didn't have a red, so my little red riding hood might have been a little pink riding hood. It was kind of faded out, so it's been a while back, but now they do have a, a, a several varieties of reds. Edgar Allan Poe, that's a fun piece. I've got a couple of orders from, for those from um, Asheville, the collector in Asheville. He said he has a booth somewhere in some antique hall in Asheville. There's my kiln, kiln with some, uh, can't really see it right there, but the story of the, the baby doll parts and the molds, I do a few of those in the summertime because I have to work some outside with those. There was a lady from Winston-Salem, we lived there five years, I met her at a show, and she said she took lessons at a place called the Sawtooth. It's downtown in Winston. I went there, they gave me a tour, it's a lot of fun. And she said they had all these molds and they were just gonna throw them away and no one wanted to fool with them. So I, I, she said, I'm taking them to my house. And so you wanna come over and look through them? You can, and I did. And we became friends and she just gave me a few baby dolls and it took me a long time to learn how to manipulate these molds. You pour the slip in the mold, you wait one hour, then you dump it back into your bucket. Your bucket has to have a, a solid mesh like we use the partition of a dog cage, it's really strong metal. 
dump the fluid back in there, and then you wait like four or five hours, and it helps if it's summertime, like I said, it's hot, because this stuff has to dry, and then you pop it out of the mold, and you have to know what you're doing, per se. I didn't know what I was doing at first, so some of my pieces, they started looking like a, a creature. It was like a blob, and then I had to do something with that, and I created these baby heads on railroad slabs of clay with little wheels and it looked with roses all around them. It looked like macabre stuff. So I turned it into, I, eventually I learned how to uh, manipulate it. Like it don't bond well. I'll show you. That's enough, I like that. It's kind of creepy, but. Okay, spray the glaze. I don't like, I used to dip the glaze in a vat of three gallons of glaze, but when you pull it out, you might have a heavy spot on the bottom, and I don't really want people to see the clear glaze. I want them to see my painting, so I try to scrape it down if I have to, or I just spray it. So I have more luck spraying these pieces. It's kind of difficult. It takes me one hour to do the whole process. So it's, it's, to me, it's worth it because I try to get the glaze consistency where I want. Okay, there's a picture of the inside of my shop, and. Um, I do that sometimes for a customer if they say what you got and I take a, a picture and mail it to them and they say I want this, this, and this. And body work, turn pieces, lots of paintings, lots of underglaze paintings, jugs, vases, birdhouse, teapots. I don't really do as many teapots and birdhouses, only only if somebody really wants them, like a customer in Matthews, North Carolina, they wanted a birdhouse, so I did one last year. This is my little little girl stories on the back. My, my daughter's name is Nadine, but I just use a kind of a, I guess you would call it a generic character, doesn't really have a name, and then she's always having adventures with, um, I can't really read it all right now, but you get the general the idea of it. So, uh, That's the amoeba one. The right? amoeba, yeah, I, I use dictionaries. I use, uh, <laughs> that's uh, Don Quixote, I think, the, um, yeah. Cervantes story. Some of these are kind of, I like to look at other artists too, like that's my interpretation of the Snow White on the back of the story of uh, cleaning house for seven dwarves is, is no picnic. <laughs> <laughs> there's a different, arc, there's a, a change of the, um, the year. The last, little, the older guy at the end is like 2022, the little guy from his banner says 2023. I got to do a few of those for a collector. Sometimes, like if you if you're if you're a potter or an artist, you you'll run across some people that are collectors, and it, it is it's a phenomenon. And I met Carol Gorelick. She was a collector. She collected for me for many years and introduced me to other collectors, kind of sort of. There's. Albert Einstein, Carol Gorelick, she used to really love Albert Einstein, so I painted him for a number of years as an addition to other pieces. And I was experimenting with shapes. I really enjoyed doing the teapots, and even the lid has a, a finial type creature on it, and I've had pictures of other galleries. And uh, there's a Edward Hicks, The Peaceable Kingdom, The Last Supper. I remember the birdhouse version of The Last Supper. When I first started out, I really wanted to impress this one particular collector, and I would do something like that, the birdhouse on the left, and I sold it to him for $30. That was like 20 years ago, long time ago. Maybe longer than that. Those pieces in the middle are all applied clay. So some friends of mine went to um, I guess it was India, and I did all these deities on clay relief. That was that was a lot of fun. I enjoyed doing that. There's some teapots. Sid Luck, Sid Luck had this glaze. He uh, one of the metters had some trouble with the glaze. It was a widow. Her husband John died, and I can't remember her name. But she asked Sid to help her figure out what this glaze was called tobacco spit, and a lot of potters, they <laughs> love this glaze, but it's hard to deal with, it runs. And uh, it does make a mess on the bottom of your kiln shelves, cause I didn't know how to do it correctly. Sid does now, but 
Carol said, I want you to paint. So I, I don't want any of this green stuff from you. So I, I did all those pieces, the, the fine detail work. I learned how to do ring jugs by watching Sid Luck. So you learn stuff. I, 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 like, to, I like to learn, keep on learning. Uh, I used to do these, you know, once every now and then. I, I really love those, but they take a day. And, and uh, I just, sometimes I just cannot dedicate a whole life. You, like I'd have to go out there and turn the pieces at night and then cover them with a light cover of plastic. Then the next day start working and you got to work solid or to get too hard and you messed up. And, but I, I'm the kind of artist I like to do one thing and get it done at one time. And there's some birdhouses, there's my swirl. Just by sheer coincidence, the movie Twister was playing on TV when I was working on one of these swirls. And I thought, that's it, that's it. I'm gonna paint a farm scene. So I did, and some, some, some guy went up to a hickory show one time and he picked it up and he said, this is a genius. And he bought it and went away and it's perfect for that particular scheme because that's a, say desert buff is a wider buff colored clay. So if you center your ball of clay down and then you're under your finger and make ruts to it and put in a darker earth and red clay if you're very fortunate, you'll come up with a smeary like swir swirl, but that's th those are not easy to do, and I learned the hard way. That's really not my cup of tea, but it worked well for a while. I started doing these before I started painting, so uh, it was a solid color items. And once I was introduced to Carol, she told me to start painting more, so I stopped doing the solid color. I don't even have. I've got the floating blue, and I use. The floating blue formula for inside of a coffee cup. Walter Fleming said he calls that a liner glaze. So you're lining like the inside of your pot for that. Some of these don't have the liner glaze, it's just clear. But most of them nowadays. See that one with the eyeball in the middle of it? That that came out the same time I think as the Lord of the Rings. So that's the eye of Sauron. I did some of those. And this this one guy from Asheville, he, he bought like 11 of those. And he said, I don't know what I'm gonna do with them, these, but I'm gonna buy them. <laughs> there's, some, there's the multi-head jug. There was one lady and her husband came to my house and her, she was buying my pottery. They called me, they tracked me down. This was before the internet, I'm pretty sure. And her husband told me the reason that she, she bought a bunch of my, like uh, my story times, like, uh, Goldilocks and Three Bears, I did Humpty Dumpty, Little Red Riding Hood, I did a bunch of those, and I said, this is what I got, and some page jokes. She'd come over and bought a bunch of stuff, and, and he told me after she was in the car or something, packing, he said, the reason she wanted to buy from you now is because she bought one of these at an auction and paid hundreds and hundreds of dollars for it because she thought that this was from like Polynesian, he was dead and all this stuff. I mean, like she thought she was buying something that was worth a ton of money. To justify her purchase of this, she bought a bunch of this. <laughs> I was like, don't tell her, don't, don't say anything about it. It's all good. And I became friends with him for many, many years. And he, he's, he bought and told, you know, it's, I don't know how long he bought, but anyway, that's all these stories bring back memories bird houses, did several of those. That that piece right there, I made that piece, I'm almost positive for American Folk Gallery. Betsy Rose said she was uh, labeling this show called Poor. So all she, she asked all these potters to, to give a picture, like a milk picture or whatever. So I did this one and it's like a, a really weird Pegasus or Maybe it's, it's a, yes, a Pegasus, a flying horse with a rainbow and in the background. And I can't remember the story if it had one at all. And she said that piece right there was the first one that sold, immediately sold. So I was like, that's great. Those are those, uh, those Nepal gods. Yeah, that's what they were. I really had a fun time doing those. I thought after I did that, that those would probably pass for some museum, maybe in Nepal. They would probably like that. Those are the dragon slayers. I did several of those, but I found out after after a time that people, in general, 
they like color better, even though I do like black and white. The leather store I worked in, there was a company called Tandy Leather that rings a bell. They had these leather stamps that used to be, you could buy them, and you still can buy them today, and you can em emboss your leather. And the principles that I learned in leather was you, you hit your leather belt, you wet it with the spongy water, hit it with the, one of these stamps, and then you rub this uh, antiquing fluid in there, and then let, after it dries, you can quickly seal it. You can put your name on there. If you forget your name, you can turn around and look at your belt. That's a, joke. That's a, that's a leather worker joke. There. He had the leather, the leather owner of the store had all these stamps that um, were so old they were discontinued. So he let me turn some wet jugs and I come in there and I use his stamps and I stamp the clay and then use the same principles after the clay has been bisfired. You rub a color in there and then you buff it, clean it with a sponge and then you shoot the clear over it and it works great. I made a few of those clown heads. I think Wendy wanted to clown lions. There's some lizards. Turtles are pretty cool. I like painting on the turtle shell. You can hang those on the wall too. I do a couple of holes in the back. I don't do them like once, maybe not even once a month, but I guess I need to turn some when I get home. When I worked in the textile mill, they, my boss, I had this, one time I had this computer job and my boss man would let me take a section. These came in three sections, so I'd take a section into the job and paint while I was watching my job sometimes. So that's why they wear really strange shapes. This started out with a guy that had a pair of pants on and legs and you could hang it on the wall. And the reason I put him in the ring of fire was one time I had drank one too many beers and I went to do something with the pants and they fell and broke. <laughs> so I thought, what am I gonna do? So I put him in a ring of fire and then mm -hmm. people started liking the ring of fire. So I started making them intentionally with a ring of fire. I store behind that piece. This piece is a recent piece. This is Pegasus with Medusa. And on the back, you can't see it because of the photo, he has his shield and on the shield is painted the Pegasus. So the story is that the Pegasus was born out of the blood of Medusa. So that's a cool piece. And this head comes off, so you can deal with it easier. That's a very bigger piece. All these pieces, I think, are carols. And you can see the Humpty Dumpty. There's me working on a piece. The whole bluegrass band. I played banjo for a long, long time until uh, started getting a little bit of arthritis, so I don't play as much now. Somebody ordered one of these recently. There's a lot of a lot of little pieces that are positioned on one statue. A collection of roosters, like they got downstairs. One collector in Ashborough, he bought one rooster and then an egg, then a bitty coming out of the egg, then two bitties, three bitties, and then four bitties, and then I think he's got one with like six or seven bitties around it. So I see him about once a year. He lives in Ashborough. Headless horseman. But that piece right there, there's two different versions of the same pottery configuration. Mm -hmm. Carol had um, a doll that I like, really like the configuration that Billy Ray Huzzy did, so I give him credit for his, and technically speaking, he probably got some of his ideas from other early American potters. That is uh, my, my idea, but I got it obviously from uh, early early, what do you call them, horrors, horror movies. There's like my acrylic paint over there. Those are early black and white horror characters that I've put. That's, and those are reclaimed wood as well. That's a roll reversal, a deer with a man's head. <laughs> Sold several of those. Got, I think that was in the local Curry Tribune or Ashboro newspaper. They, they did an article on me for that. They liked that. For some reason, they came to the house and there it is. But I had other pieces as well. The, those are miniature paintings. Carol really loved those miniature paintings. Um, Noah's Ark. And some of them was, a, a, I guess you'd call them word picture puzzles, rebus.
these are some different versions of the Incredible, the Incredible Hulk. I did that. So, um, superhero characters, Wonder Woman. Painted, painted bust. Lots of paint. This is a guy with a wheelbarrow <laughs> pushing pumpkins <laughs> with a plumber's crack. I need to do another one of those. More turtles. But that's a. Uh, what do you call a little girl that Pandora's box? Yeah. Is um I'll see that couple George times. Custer. Yeah, I got her somewhere. Okay. Yeah, the drawings. You're getting ready to do some yeah. drawings. So I have to start wanting to do some artwork. That was a, a pun off of Edward Hicks, The Peaceable Kingdom. A guy getting uh, abducted by a UFO. Most of them are black and white, but I, I, I have started doing some color. I think I have over probably 150, something like that. That's a rooster with a book that says Buck Hunting by Sea a Doodle. So I did the black and white version of that uh, in 12 hours. That's pretty good, I thought. A lot of work. But the color pencil is like a whole, a whole nother creature. It takes forever. That was my spin off of uh, the Gothic. No, no, I forget the American Gothic painting yet without the pitchfork. That was one of my childhood memories. My parents killed roosters, and I was a little. I must have been really little. And my dad chopped the head off the rooster. My mom picked me up by my arms and the rooster went headless underneath me. Gruesome story. Mm -hmm. When I was a little kid. Some of these are acrylic. That's acrylic paintings. That's colored pencil. That's watercolor with a uh, black outline. So that's the newest piece. So that one, these are, these are new. Yeah, quick. On the pottery, like on the face jug and some of the more uh, complicated pieces, do you sketch all that out first? No. Or is it just I, sort of I, I do have a book with my, my notes of like a story, and then I keep it there as reference, and then I can pick through it. Like, uh, you know, the little girl with the amoeba, uh, I have those stories written down. And, the, you know, stories of marsupials, like my, the little girl's favorite marsupial was uh, a possum because she was from North Carolina, but if she happened to run into a kangaroo, she'd say hello, it'd be nice. That's, you know, but because she, they're both marsupials, but because she's from North Carolina, it makes sense. You know? so, and then, you know, I got one from um, the uh, Venus flytrap. Her, her favorite carnivorous plan is the Venus flytrap because she's from North Carolina and they're nowhere else. She, they're nowhere, nowhere else, you know, but, but there, but she don't want to brag or nothing like that. <laughs> <laughs> it just spins around a lot. And uh, stories of uh, the Pisgah Covered Bridge, that's local stories. And I had a bungee jumper off the Pisgah Covered Bridge. It was ridiculous, it made no sense, but it was, it was memorable for people in that area. But yeah, I do have a book. Thank you. I, I probably will have a book published someday, but not right now. No. You know, it's definitely, I've got enough material, but I'd rather have it, I'd, I'd rather talk to somebody that's more literate with the composition instead of just all illustrations. You know, it might, it might be fine just all illustrations like that, like that book right there, because you could go through there and you could find illustrations of Perseus and, uh, you know, and, or Perseus, Perseus and Medusa, and I think it's Perseus and Andromeda, and all these different characters that you've seen before. But uh, it just, there's really no end to it, the, the, the material. I've never got bored with it. Yeah, question. Do you have any um, 
projects or goals over the next you know few years like where I want to go these are some ideas I want to explore this is something I'm going to challenge myself with and I have ways. been toying with the idea of doing I acquired these closet doors that are from a sometime probably in the mid 50s mobile home that they're solid wood having them they're 80 inches tall so they're like that tall and position them together and painting them like wallpaper and having some articles of furniture in, in this like a, call it a composition or I don't know the other word for it but you have, could have the walls would be the room and then the table and I could do a painting on the table and have a checkerboard on top and I've got two sets of chess sets that I made at home that are really pretty weird and then I could have that and then make two chairs and then I could have that as what you could be called a diorama or something but it would be life size and then have a fake floor tile tile design that I, that I come up with installation art. installation art yeah and then have some other mirrors maybe a bow fireplace mantle with one of those little fans that blow flames like that that was so cool I like that <laughs> something fun yeah, that, that's that's something that I've been toying with, collecting. Yeah. Uh, I really like the teeth on your face jugs. Yeah. Um, so can you talk about how you make those? Yep, I forgot. Um, so that's three types of clay. Uh, little loafers is a soft, very soft white clay that you don't have to paint anymore. So that's, I forgot, that is another type of clay that I do use. It's called little loafers from high water. And it's almost impossible to turn. It is so soft. Some potters can do it. I can't do that. I've never, even, never even tried. But uh, I just use it for my eyes and teeth and uh, the, the the nails of the uh, lion. So uh, I don't have to paint them. And it's super duper white, like the fangs on the um, the spider. And I do a saber tooth tiger as well. But I don't have one here tonight. I've got some at home. They're ready to glaze. So I told Londa earlier I'm ready to spray glaze. But uh, not sure probably not not today mm. i did want to say one thing when he was mm -hmm. telling you guys a certain times like an hour or two hours or whatever he wasn't talking about the whole process he was just talking about one segment of that whole process if you go through the whole process of either turning or hand building and uh, you know this firing and waiting for it to dry and spraying glaze and glaze fire it's it's you know days and days and days it's a long process yeah it, it does I, take I mean, you guys to get the wrong idea that you whip something out of that one does that go happen <laughs> yeah i timed myself on the last uh five dollar bill painting like that whole painting right there it was uh six hours just just on that mm -hmm. so and then uh physically to make the wooden drawer it took one hour just to build a drawer so so that's this part of it. I, I really enjoy doing that, but those those, those furniture pieces are generally, generally made when it's really not super duper cold out because I don't have heat in that one building. So I don't do that. Like I don't do the wood building. I might do the primer or something in another building and then cover it with polyurethane in another building to where it's not like fumigating the whole cardboard. I'll do that and then turn a fan on it. So it's a, it's a time process. It's like Edwin Metters told me he likes to let his roosters dry on a sunshiny day three days. So that's just a rule of thumb, but I'd let them dry you know, more than that because I'd rather be patient, let the pieces dry, than bis fire them. I think Sid Luck told me you, you bis fire them and, and you, you slowly raise the temperature below 212 degrees, which is supposed to be the boiling part of boiling point of water so all these water molecules have to be out of the clay or to crack your piece so I just learned just the very basics I forget all the technical names of silica feldspar bentonite all, I know the ingredients and I've got them you know tattooed somewhere <laughs> but I don't know the, the meaning of them like kaolin is clay and stuff like that but I could go back and do research on it but once I learn what works then I just you know, do what I do. So that's the, um, you would call it the canvas. Yeah. That's, that's basically, in a, in a nutshell, the, the, the formats I use. 
and then you have to figure it out. Like when I built my first line, I just happened to have some grocery bags near, they're soft, they were nearby. So I thought this line will never stand up on its own. So I stuffed his torso with grocery bags. And then after it stands up, I cut a hole in the top and then pull the grocery bags out because his legs are firm. So it's a step by step. You know the legs come, turn, turn his torso, put it under a grocery bag, set it aside. While that's firm enough, you turn two heads out of half a pound of clay. There's a formula involved. And then while those heads, the, the, it's like a dome, just like a dome, set them to the side. And then when they're firm enough, you build legs. Then after your legs are built, take it, take the torso, uh, put some grocery bags in there, and then make it into, Sid Luck called it a Chinese duck egg. For some reason, it looks like a giant egg. Turn it upside down, put the legs on, flip it back over, and then when that's getting firm, cut holes in the top, pull all the grocery bags out, and put the heads on. So I, I guess I should I should uh, film it sometime. I told, I told my wife I, I could, you know, like someone said, give workshops on how I build it, but would there be a possibility of someone becoming my competition? Could be. You know, I thought about that. Maybe do it when I retire, and then I'm done. You know, I'm, I've, I've opened the barn door then. You know, there could be other people that want to go insane doing this. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. yeah, I'm fascinated by just the history of food, do food lines or food dogs, whatever yeah. you call them. And I didn't sort of realize their impact until I got to go to Beijing to the Summer Palace years ago and saw them there and realized that's such an ancient Asian motif. No doubt. And yeah. how did, I've never seen anybody write or figured out why North Carolina potters, who probably never had been to China or anything, have been doing that for decades, if not, you know, even into the 19th century. I, I do have pictures somewhere, I think some guy with the last name Bell, that did the Bell Lion from England. So I went to, uh, one, of the, one of the first potters in North Carolina was called Peter Craven. So I, I, somebody told me how to get to his grave site, so I went to the grave site, and Sid said, they'll let you go to the kiln site and knock on the door. The, the Cravens don't live there anymore. It's in Coleridge, North Carolina. It's near Ashboro, so I went there. Knocked on the door and the farmer said, you pottery people are crazy, you know. Why, why would you want to go to his kiln site? And I was like, well, I'm a potter, I just want to know. And he said, come on with me. So he took me to this fence, see this cow pasture, jump over this fence here, go down to the bottom where the water's at, the potter need water. You'll see pottery shards that were goodbye. So he went back in his house and I jumped the fence, went down there and found shards. One of the shards, went to, going to the history of, you know, North Carolina thing and the history of food dog. But there were three blue lines on the shard, and I asked Sid, "Look, where did this blue come from? This is cobalt. They don't have cobalt here." And he said, it "Came off of a boat from England. So everything comes from somewhere." So those two dogs, me and Vonda went to one. Uh, George Douglas MacArthur, like five-star general, went to his museum, and the, the Japanese people had given him a, a food dog shape. I was, of course, I knew what it was. But it was odd, odd that it had spikes of glaze all over it where you literally could not pick this thing up. And I think they were psychologically saying, you know, you can't touch this. You know, like the song, you know. But anyway, that's another food dog that I saw. And some of them are in China, they're guarding temples and stuff. So there's probably, it goes on different historical, you know, like we was talking earlier, uh, yesterday about etymology, the origin of words goes on and on and on. Depends on who you're talking to. But I have looked at them. I, I, you know, I've got pictures at home. Some of the lion or food dogs paws on a ball. Like Crystal King, she does one of those. I don't remember ever doing that, but I mean, some potter do. I thought about doing a skull, you know. Mm -hmm. Just spin, spin the ball. Everybody, every potter has got different stuff. Like I did grapes on a vase for a while. And underneath one of the leaves of, of the, the grape vase was a skull tucked underneath there. Just for kicks, you know. Just for fun. Let's go ahead. 
Uh, so what some of your face jugs, it's just the space or other ones it's like the eyes are for different figures. Yeah. So how do you decide that? Do you when you're designing it, do you go like, oh well this one's gonna be like that devil up there? It's like the two eyes, one's on a person, the other one's on a larger figure. Yep. So do you go with that preconception? Well, pre -con preconceived <laughs> preconceived. Like um, if I'm doing and also in North Carolina, the Siamese twins, Ying and Chang, they're buried uh, Mount Airy. Um, I do the eyes closer together, so the painting is uh, two Siamese twins very close together, and the, the band of skin that uh, connected the two twins goes right over the face jug's nose, and those are cool. They, they sell pretty good. I don't do them every day, maybe once uh, six months or so. And then this guy, I forget his name right now, he's a new collector. He lives out west, like in Indiana, somewhere in, in Illinois, one of the states that starts with an I. He wanted me to do um, the woman in gold. What's the artist's name? Clint. 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 He, he wanted me to do my spin on the, the Clint, um, the, the woman in gold, or any of his paintings. So I, I'm, I'm trying to determine how to approach that. And I'm thinking I'm going to, as a potter, wax out a couple of areas. You can use gulf wax from the grocery store, melt it in the frying pan, very carefully paint it on some of the pottery. And then after you're finished, you can take gold house paint or something to give it a variety because Clint used different medias, mediums, yeah, like gold paint or gold leaf. I don't have gold leaf, so I'm going to use gold paint. Just a few spots and then maybe some some enamel black paint. I've been looking at Clint's work recently. You know, that's just, just just another preconceived notion of me planning the uh, item before I do it. And uh, the background. You know, go ahead. So I'm actually doing a whole like brown presentation because one of your pieces is actually here. So I'm doing like information on that. And um, we I went into researching about like face jokes and how have they appropriated those. Is, um, can you like tell me the difference of you not appropriating like from those jugs because yours is a unique and like your own ways and I know you're probably not trying to appropriate the actual history of face jugs so how do you like kind of like separate the two? Oh, uh, I use it as a canvas to tell a little cartoon story. If you're familiar with the Far Side, mm -hmm. it's another artist. Uh, I kind of give him credit for the the idea. And he's certainly not the first, but he's the most probably well known of single caption art. See, I'm limited. It's not a it's not a book. I can't do a whole story, so I have to do the one shot there and do the story on the back. So it's got to fit. And then some of them are short, some of them are long. I have to paint H E W O R E with a paintbrush. So that you know, if I want to have a long drawn out story. I gotta accept the fact that I gotta paint it on there. So sometimes, if you're saying how do I distinguish between the two, that's that's what I do. I use the face jug as a canvas, and um, you know I enjoy it. I, I do. I, I keep coming up with ideas, and then I have to sometimes pull the reins back. You know I can't play. You know, like the per Perseus and Medusa. That's a great. That's a great idea. But you know I don't want to be pigeonholed in that because some of the stories I do as repeat items and then I don't do them for years. Like I don't have any memory at all of doing this story right here. This story. That, that's kind of an independent story. It's strange. Strange. You know, squirrels fighting over cucumbers. <laughs> so pretty strange. Yeah. I did one of an amazing starfish guy who harvested cucumbers. And he was never encumbered by that. <laughs> <laughs> he had one, it was a psychotic starfish guy, his superhero. He had a starfish in one eye and he harvested cucumbers. <laughs> Strange. <laughs> but uh, it's fun. Thank you. <laughs>